Welcome to Artwell. I'm your host, Jacob Kelly, and today on the show, we are joined by Oscar-winning cinematographer Russell Carpenter. Russell is a frequent collaborator of James Cameron, working with him as his director of photography on True Lies, Titanic, Avatar The Way of Water, and the upcoming Avatar 3. Before we get into today's interview, I want to remind you that this season of the podcast is brought to you by the Artwell newsletter, which you can subscribe to in the show notes. There are no breaks in this business. You make your breaks. The reason I'm in this room right now is because my music's very dope. Let's try to find something that people remember 20 years later. If you just truly love cinema with enough passion, then you can't help but make a good movie. Break rules. Leave the world more interesting for your being here. Make good art. Can you tell me about It Came From The Pet Shop? <laughs> Oh my God, you are the only person on the face of the earth that's ever uh, mentioned that. But, uh, well, yeah, I mean, I'll, every cinematographer starts out somewhere, you know, and, and 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 I'm sure there are a lot of cinematographers who, with their friends, just started making really goofy movies. Uh, and I forget how old I was. I was uh, probably 15 or 14 or something like that. Uh, and, uh, my friend got a eight millimeter camera and we just started playing with it. And I, I grew up on movies like, uh, King Kong and Godzilla and stuff like that. That was, that, th those were my classics, you know, what, what, what can I say? So my sister, for some reason was an avid, uh, reptile lover. She had these Chuck Wallace, which are probably the ugliest lizard on the face of the earth. So uh, we cut out some wings. We basically double stick taped them to the poor lizard. Then we then we tied thread to the lizard's tail, the head, and maybe his a, li a little bit under his arms. And we just flew him back and forth in front of a a, a landscape painting that that uh, my mom had, and uh, that that was one of our first films. But. Uh, uh, Truly in keeping with where things fell later for me, though. But uh, yeah, yeah, that's that's amazing that you bring that up. I was going to ask if there's a line that can be drawn from it came from the pet shop to where you are now. Like, is there anything there that you look back with? It'd be like the preparation process, the effects, the frame, anything that you can trace a line from that to where you are today. Well, I think I think the main line is that as a very young person, you know, watching these old films on my TV set, uh, especially King Kong or at Godzilla or the, basically this, this, the films that took me to places where I, they, that were amazing. I just thought these were the most amazing pictures, uh, in the world. And I, I and I love King Kong and I love the, uh, the, the, um, the forests in King Kong and, and the unusual creatures and it is weird because I think that starting there and then say ending with Avatar, which was exactly that, except done six trillion times better. You know, uh, so it was. It was. I, I mean, I think that there's a there's a a light in that, and then through through line to that, but also as as, as finally you know because I in uh, college I. I didn't know what to do, but I was making, uh, I was an English major in college, but I, I got a job at uh, a public television station and I, I did a lot of uh, documentaries and stuff like that. And I, I had really had no idea that I was going to go into anything that was like uh, uh, filmmaking. I mean, as we, as we know, motion picture filmmaking, uh, but I was still watching pictures and uh, uh, movies. And I mean, I was just, Ruck by the whole process of uh, a group of people, a group of filmmakers being able to spread, you know, it's almost like sorcery or magic to create these conditions that would take the viewer to a totally different reality than the one they, they normally will have it. And then I started reading American Cinematographer magazine and I, I, I felt like, wow, these people are the real magicians. These are I mean, they are uh, what's being done with light and camera and uh, uh, 
I mean, just just nuance. So, uh, I, I started to really see that maybe this is something that I really wanted to do. But what, it wasn't until um, I was out of college and I was working at a public television station and there was a, uh, a direct, we were doing documentaries, but there was a director that uh, really desperately wanted not to do anything educational. He, so he, he, uh, he, he convinced a furniture czar in Orange County in California to give us enough money to make our first picture. It was a zombie movie. And if, if the furniture czar's wife could be a very, very prominent zombie in the movie, you know, that was the deal. So we made this thing. It was called Soul Survivor. It was pretty dreadful, but miraculously it was released uh, i mean not you know in, in the select say select theaters for let's say about four days you know or well the longest run was maybe two weeks somewhere but i think i was just given this totally false hope that uh you know well i like what i you know i like the experience but that i would move out of uh where I was, we, and it was not a far leap to, but go to uh, LA and try to uh, try to somehow try my hand at, at making fictional movies, and that was that was a major uh, reality check there because you know as soon as I made that move, I realized that there were just a ton of people out there that were incredibly talented, and it did you know it did not look good for me. But <laughs> that's what I thought. But the other problem was that I was that extremely shy, you know, basically an introvert. And anybody who wants to get, anybody who wants to cure themselves as being an introvert should go to work in this business, you know, especially as a uh, director of photography or something like that. Because then you find out you just have to be the, the person you never thought you were. You know, you have, you have to get involved with people to a major, major degree. But I, I, uh, I worked, uh, I, I just had a tremendous tr- problem getting started. And, and the problem was, problem was really in that I was just basically afraid to pick up the phone and call anybody. I didn't know anybody. And, uh, and what I did find though, is that when I made these phone calls to, to places, you know, people were always encouraging, you know, I, I, I thought people were going to be just kind of brutal. They were really, really nice, uh, but it was only it was only until people that I'd worked with on documentaries, kind of they worked their way into Hollywood too, and, and these were low budget, no, no budget films, but they would get me in for an interview, which it, and that was at first that was a terrifying process, and then I just realized that my job was to go into this interview and just make it learn as much as I could, but also you know, how to transform the whole process from one of, you know, fear into I could have a good time just talking to these people and not even thinking that I was going to get the job. So uh, so that was kind of prying wrestle open a little bit to, to, you know, get out there. And it was a long process, though, a very long process. Uh, for me, because I was not, you know, um, I would take very small steps. I mean, I was, I literally went from zero budget films to films with, with maybe a little money. And then, I mean, over a period of years, and it was several years that it took me to work myself into a position where I felt like, oh, I, at least I think I'm going to get some work here. You know, and and uh, and that was, uh, but that that was a real process. And, and the other thing, and I, I, maybe other other cinematographers have the same issue. Is like, I got to a point where I couldn't stop trying to make it as a cinematographer because I I knew absolutely not, I didn't know how to do anything else. And I don't remember where I wrote this quote down from, but it, it's you. And you said, "There's a lot of people who come into this business immensely talented and make a mark quickly." For me, it was a gradual process, but I enjoyed the gradualness. And I was curious what you enjoyed about the gradualness of that process. 
you know, at that time, and I, you know, I feel like in so many ways, I'm a really different person now, but at that time, I just, I just felt that if I persisted, even if it was persisting slowly, if I just, if I made progress gently, <laughs> you know, things were going to be okay. And I really didn't know where, I, honest to God, I had no idea where I was going. All I, all I wanted to do, all I wanted to do was be on a set and have that, that, uh, that responsibility of, of making images and, and, to, and the excitement of being r right in the middle of the creative process where, uh, I was going to make and see the film first of the camera. And especially in the early days when I was operating myself, uh, I mean, it, it was, it was, again, even though they might've been, I did a lot of chop sake movies and, you know, some really <laughs> not good stuff, but I enjoyed myself so much and that, and that's what I wanted to do. And I know, could, but I would look at other people who took their time. Uh, well, there were people, you know, who, who just kind of like, came down from the mountain of the gods, you know, like at Chivo, you know, and, and at that time, Janusz Kaminski, and I just said, okay, well, they, they just they just landed from some other planet because they're amazing, you know, like right out of the box, they're amazing. And uh, I'm just going to uh, uh, just be happy to, 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 sur to survive in the business. And the other thing I learned, and I, I've said this before, but you, if you put out the energy of what you want to do, if you are constantly putting out that energy, I do feel that the universe, the world, nature is going to come back with a response. You know, I, I, I really believe that, and maybe it's you know mumbo jumbo, but I, I. For, at least somehow I feel that that's true for me. If you're not doing anything, nothing's not, you know, things aren't going to come back. But, uh, and things are so different now that uh, people can get their work out so easily. I mean, you get, you, you get your website and all of a sudden somebody in Antarctica can see what you did last week. You know, it's, it's a completely different world. And also, I, I may be, you know, rambling here, but also the most amazing thing is that with 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 a camera that is no not like top of the line, you can make amazing images. And so I just see the opportunities for people who want to work and show their work are very very different from what they they were. But I guess where I started with this was that I just um, along that slow line of a success or something there are just going to be tremendous. <laughs> They're going to be failures where you think, okay, I'm done. You know, nothing's going to happen here. And you never know what's going to lead to anything. And, and, uh, I, I did four, I did four episodes of a, a really w wonderful little show called, uh, Oh, the wonder years. And, but it was a television show. And as this was, and, what they what they really wanted as a cinematographer, besides people who had to work tremendously fast, was somebody who was basically a traffic cop on the set, and and would basically also control the, uh, you know, the impulses of the director, you know, to make it. And I was not that guy, you know that that wasn't me. I lasted like four episodes when I was gone, and uh, and then back it felt like back to square one. And then I took a, a film called uh, Pet Cemetery 2, and I really didn't want to do it because it was this boy, I have done enough of these films, but I did this. Uh, a wonderful director, Mary Lambert. And this is, you know, and I'm just going because you probably know where this is going, but, but okay, so I'm doing this film, and one of the, uh, the child stars in Pet Cemetery is. Uh, Eddie Furlong, and he's just come off of uh, Terminator 2. And uh, 
it's just one of those weird things. I mean, that uh, the Eddie is the people who worked as his kind of handlers because he was a miner. They they said, you know, I don't know what it is. We, we just think he'd work really well with Jim Cameron. And I said, okay, yeah, I the greens. And then uh, and then there were a couple of other people who who kind of mentioned that. And then Jim came to. Uh, uh, Eddie Furlong's birthday party on the set, you know, and we'll, uh, he sat on the back steps, and I said hi, and we talked for a little while, and uh, you know, that was that. And then a few, um, I don't know how many, many months later, I got a call from his producer and said, Jim is, he wants to do, he doesn't want to do a, a union picture, he wants to do a, a small, low budget picture. And uh, I had, I don't, what I did have to show Jim was that I had done another another disaster of a film, you know, uh, one of the one of the, one of the worst films that's ever been made. Except it looked, I thought it looked really good, you know. So I took footage from that and I timed it the way I wanted to see it, and that's what I showed to uh, to Jim, and he he said, "Okay, let's do this." Two weeks later, that film went away, you know. And I, I, I said, okay, well, that's as close as I'll ever get to, you know, somebody doing the kind of work that he's doing. Uh, and then I was working in, uh, I don't know how many months later, I was working in New Orleans with John Wu on John Wu's first picture in the United States. And I got another call from Jim's producer, and she says, uh, he wants he wants to do this film. He's got this film coming up. He wa- he wants to talk to you about it. Just he just wants to have lunch with you. I didn't even ask him. I asked that person. I didn't say what film is it. You know, I just all I said was okay. <laughs> and then uh, you know, it's like yeah, uh, uh, you know, I'm not that kind of person. I like, just go. So all of a sudden, we're looking for my crew and I, and this is before the internet was really going. We're looking through all the trades, trying to figure out what he was going to do. And it was, uh, all I could see was a film called True Lies. And I went right past that film because I thought, well, he wants something. He's got a documentary coming up and stuff like that. And I, again, I could just, again, couldn't put myself in the same box, you know, didn't see myself in that arena. And uh, when I did get back to California, that's, uh, we had lunch. And halfway through the lunch, Jim started saying, we, <laughs> you know, and then and then when we and 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 I didn't even know I'm going is he still as hired or or not you know and I left to lunch not really knowing anything a few days later my agent called me and said you idiot yeah he he, he hired you you know so, so that that was I'm just saying you know the 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 road to moving along in terms of what you do is is not straight at all. I mean, it's up and down and backwards and even off the graph, and then you fight your way back onto the graph, and now things look like they're going somewhere. So my situation was very, very different than, than I mean, some of the amazing, you know, uh, people we've seen come come into a sitch, into Hollywood very soon and, and make their mark. That wasn't my story at all. And to your point about putting the effort in and that'll be rewarded and just putting putting yourself out there because you never know who's watching. Because while you met James at Eddie's Furlong's birthday, and actually I know you met him many, many years before at the TV station, but he also saw, I believe it was Lady in White and Lawnmower Man before meeting you. Uh, you know, I don't know what he saw. And uh, okay, I, kudos to you. You uh, you read pretty much everything. I mean, because I don't know how... how I don't know how many times I've mentioned that. Yeah, I was working at the public broadcasting station back in the in the in the seventies, and when somebody uh, brought him through, and he was just looking in. And I mean, we went briefly, and, and that's all it was, you know. But I mean, I but I didn't forget that when. But still, you know, and I don't even think I've ever talked to him about that. You know, but it is one of those strange, strange things. Yeah. The world works in mysterious ways sometimes. That's the sum of it. 
isn't it? I mean, the world works in mysterious ways, but you you keep putting out that energy, you know. And if you're if you're not working, you're looking at the work of other people, or you're or working to. I mean, you're constantly working, even if you're not working on a job. I mean, to 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 get yourself to that place where you can present yourself as a knowledgeable person. And when you got that job for True Lies, I think there's no better summary of that than probably a trial by fire. I don't think I could survive, you know, another trial by fire that uh, that True Lies. I mean, it was like there were just days where, you know, because that was back, you know, in his, you know, whatever what you call his his view of making a film was, we're taking a castle. This is the siege of a castle. And every day is going to be a siege, and that's basically what it was, you know. It was, and uh, he, he, I think he was hard on everybody, but if if you're the person who's literally, you know, three feet from his altar <laughs> for most of the day, <laughs> makes it even harder, you know. And uh, I had just my only mantra was, you know, and these, you know, I've said this before, but th- this mantra was. No, bat, no matter how hard it was, I just said, I have to have this credit. You know, I have to go where I want to go. I have to have this credit. And if this is what it takes, this is what it takes. But I mean, there were, there were some days where, you know, I don't, uh, well, you know, what I'm, going to, what I'm going to say just to, to balance this out is that Jim has changed so much. You know, he still, he still has this, he wants he he wants the world in terms of what he's asking of the people around him, but he's now he's got a sense of humor about the whole situation, and it's it is the the sense of a rapid fire temper and then you know flame throwing criticism is uh it's 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 somehow got away and yet what he's doing is just as good as you know. Uh, what he was doing before, but that was, uh, and that, so there was a general thing in there, even, even, uh, when I went to do Titanic, it, it was, it, it was extremely hard, extremely, uh, extremely challenging, but it wasn't challenging in the sense that your life, was. you know, I do, and I don't know whether I had just gained admittance to some you know, I've been tested by fire before, and he says, "Okay, I'm not going to do that again." I don't know what what it was, but but uh, yeah, it's uh, uh, yeah. Everybody has a different story. What can I say? I I have to know. Could you really not see Arnold's eyes in the dailies in the bedroom? Oh, you know that story because that was that was that that was a kind of a turning point in how things went in true on true lives because. Uh, Pre production on Tree Lives went great. Yeah, you know, because I had heard that, you know, several people told me, you know, Jim's really, really hard on those cinematographers. And we got into prep and we got into scouting and we went through all of it. And it was I mean, I just thought, wow, this is this is going great. You know, and so we started filming and things were were going great. And uh uh so of course, somewhere in my mind, I, I just get the the idea that, okay, well, whatever it is, I just I've I've, I've broken the code. <laughs> That's what I thought. And then so, so we cut back to L.A. and we went to see some dailies at the the screening room at the Lightstorm facilities that were in Santa Monica at the time. And everybody in the, you know all the department heads are there, and I'm sitting right next to Jim. So. You have this scene where Arnold is supposed to come home at night from his first caper out in the snow, and his wife Jamie Lee Curtis is sleeping, and he he's taking I don't know oh he's putting on his ring or something, and he he looks in the mirror, and I say oh I go that's a little dark. It's not I don't know if I I, I felt like I could see his eyes, but I said. That's a little dark. I'm going to need. To, uh, I, I'm going to go print this up three points, you know. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, and then I look next to him, and Jim's just—he's just his head. He, he's, like, 
you know, he, hanging low and he's just shaking it. And Jim, what's wrong? What's wrong? What's wrong? He says, I have the highest paid actor in this or any other parallel universe, and I can't see his eyes. And Jim, I'm just going to print this up to your points. I'm sure it'll be fine. And he says, no, this scene is ruined, and we have to go film it again. And I'm just dying because all of this is loud enough that everybody in the everybody there can hear. And another scene comes up. And he says, where did you learn how to read a light meter? <laughs> just going, I'm just going, what? You know, what happened? And then every once in a while, another thing, you know, like it was, you know, my grandmother could light a scene better than this. And so by the end of the screening, I just want to get out of the room. I mean, as fast as I can. I was out of the room before the lights came on. Went out to the went out to the parking lot behind the, the building and called my wife and said, I gave it my best try. You know, I, I'm going to be fired very soon, if not today, tomorrow. And I looked up and there's a producer and the first assistant director. They're just looking at me and they've got these funny shit eating grins, you know? And I go, and I go, what, what's so funny? And they go, he says that and he does that to everybody. I don't know. He says, he said, he said, all you have to do is call um, Adam Greenberg or Michelle Solomon or just talk to them for a little bit. And I forget who he called. I think it was Michelle. He said, did he use the line, where did you learn to read a light meter? <laughs> I go, yeah. And out of that, I decided, okay, all right, all right. I, I'm in. I'm not, you know, I'm digging in and I'm out. I'm, I need this credit. I'm just, I'm in. And that, that, but that was, that was my first trial by fire. And I hope never, I hope nobody ever has to go through that again. But there, there will always be, you know, difficult directors, sometimes challenging directors and sometimes just difficult directors. So anyway, that, that was my baptism. And ultimately, you pushed through. You got the credit. It changed, I would imagine, it changed the trajectory of your career. But I'm I'm curious, what are some things you should be aware of when you start to have success like that? You've been doing all these low-budget movies, and then you do a big-budget movie, it goes well, and now you're kind of in this other stratosphere. Like, what should you be aware of when you make that jump? Well, the, the first thing, just as you're going along, even when you're starting... You know, I, I think even when you're starting, you have to get out and spend as somehow figure out a way to, to get invited to or spend as much time on a set as you can and watch how things go because that's your real world film school right there. But as you move along, and and I, I think people really have to realize this, they may have an artistic vision and, and certain artistic gifts, but they also have to realize that they're a brand, you know, and I said, oh man, that sounds horrible. I said, this is, somebody told me this, and I, I believe, you're a brand because when you step onto a set, when you have an experience, somebody has an experience of you, they will remember that, and they will remember how you were to work with, uh, what you did when things got tough, and then things will get tough every day on a set. So how do you, how do you cope with that? Uh, do you lose your temper? You know, because now I, I think now it's kind of removed out of the era. Uh, you know, like uh, there were that you could get away with things back in the seventies and eighties and nineties, where you know you could be talented, but you could be talented and terrible. I mean, you'd have a terrible temper or something. People would still work with you, but now there are so many talented people. Directors and producers are going to say, "Life's too short." You know, why do we want to put ourselves through this? But you, that, but but you have that brand uh, as you go along, and I think that that for me, uh, having having that success of that, that that did open up things. Not not on so much really big pictures, but on smaller pictures. And um, I knew, uh, you know, I knew that they wouldn't like. I felt like, well, they're not going to, nothing's going to be like true lies, but I'm, 
And again, I'm just happy to be on the film and I'm happy to be working with this people, with this director. And then, but I would say that as you go along, the thing that you realize is that how important it has to have people you like on your career who are really, really good at their job, you know, and as you go along, you just, you can, you have the luck to surround yourself with people who are extremely good at their job, but they're all just great to be around. You want to be on the set. And that's, that's the big difference that, so coming off of say the success of true lives is I had the opportunity to work with better and better people. And it was, uh, and so that was a real gift. When you're talking about your brand, you talked about how kind of keeping your composure, keeping your cool in stressful moments on set. I'm curious what your approach is or how you can make art when catastrophe is happening all around you. Well, that is exactly, you, you just hit the crux of what being a director of photography is. I mean, yeah, you, uh, y- younger, we, uh, when we're young, we see these films that the masters have made. You know, for me, it was the Torres Dorara where you're watching uh, Heaven's Gate, where you're watching, I mean, so many, uh, so many people to learn from. And you go, I want to do that. I want to do that. And, and so you go and you learn to do that. You, I mean, at least you get, you get enough going that you're invited onto a set to work. And then you have to realize, oh, I have to make beauty in the, in the midst of chaos because that's what's happening all the time. Things are going wrong all the time. And sometimes you never have enough time. Well, how do I, how do I make a really beautiful image without taking a lot of time? And uh, it's just, so there's this real realization that I've got to be, you know, you've got to be doing this and then spinning a bunch of plates on the end of sticks at the same time. And all these things have to go on. And you say, well, I want to be an artist. But then you realize, oh my God, the reality is, uh, well, I have to be a scientist in some way. You have to know what, you know, how these things work, and especially, and if you don't, you have to have somebody on your crew who knows how this, this stuff works. And then you just have to be, um, uh, things that I never thought I'd have to be. You have to be, you have to manage, learn to manage things so that when you go out on a, a scout, you know who to tell on your crew. You know how to tell them what this, this, and this, so that you have the tools that you need the day you need. You're going to shoot, so you you really have to be uh, logistically organized in a way that you might never have pictured yourself having to be that organized to make you know a beautiful a beautiful image. You know to make this art this incredible visual poetry there's there's all these mechanics and mechanisms behind it that that i realized you would have to deal with and then then the other thing is uh uh be a politician which is not given to most of us or some well some of us at least and uh and that doesn't mean just i mean i don't mean that in a starky way i mean you have to realize that but one, you have to realize that everybody there and, and, you know, the producers might have been putting a lot of time into getting this film up, maybe years getting this film up and going. You have to respect their needs. You have to, uh, uh, but there, there's the political, how you deal with people politically and especially the just the politics of working with uh, actors and actresses to let them know, and, and a lot of times this can happen during the screen test because that's maybe the first time you're meeting them, but they'll get to give them a sense that you really care about how they look and that you will be watching out for them. And, you know, a lot of what I've done has been very much in the mainstream, you know, and you get romantic comedies and stuff like that, or it's just like... um not only is that your job to make gorgeous people look even more gorgeous, is uh, but it's, it's you know it's just uh, a lot of us as cinematographers we we know we kind of know what we want to do 
with the artist part. The, the, and just then to realize that there are, are so many other aspects that come into it that, and that you are dealing with a lot of people and you're not the only person on the set. And you're not, and, and people are always watching you. So, uh, you know, if it's, you might have something that goes really, really wrong, uh, you know, for whatever reasons, but people are watching the, the cinematographer to see what he or she is doing. And if, if you can still impart uh, at least a, a positive project a, a positive vibration on the set, it's, it's a, a real help in terms of how the rest of the day goes. You mentioned how amongst all this chaos while balancing all these different roles that come with being a cinematographer, sometimes you don't necessarily have the time you want to make these beautiful images. But do you think that sometimes having this time restriction creates constraints to play within that will lead to you creating a beautiful image you wouldn't have created otherwise if you'd had as much time as you wanted? Well, I think that, that that's true, especially if you have a partnership with, uh, I mean, if your partnership with the director, the production designer, but it also especially the first assistant director, because, you know, if, if you form a relationship uh, with a first assistant director that is non-adversarial, where you're both committed to making the most of what you have with your time, then you can work in pre-production and try to figure out, well, what do we do with this? We know we've only got two hours in the morning to do this, and it seems like a lot of, do you know, all of that. And if the if your director is with you or, and your first assistant director is with you, it's then then that kind of, uh, those kind of obstacles can be overcome. So that, you know, like every, I just, like every movie, is, every movie is different though. I mean, it just based on who, who all is involved. Is, is pre-production the most important part of your process? Yeah. If you have the pre-production time, and especially when I was starting out and maybe called this from your research, but my process was to make what I called a brain book, which is basically putting everything, you know, about you can't about every scene into this book. And you have a technical part of that. And at the time it was, okay, what film stock am I going to use? What lenses am I going to use? What filtration am I going to use? Uh, and uh, I would do this for every scene. And then I, while I was in pre-production, I keep going back to these scenes and I go, okay, my solution to this is that, well, I think I'd give it a scene minus now, you know, and maybe, and then you'd be working on the other scenes and then you come back to it and say, wow, oh, I just thought of something. Oh, now it's a B plus approach to the life. <laughs> I think I've got a B plus here, you know? And so you, you just kind of work your way along with that. At the end of this whole process, I, I've got a very you know, at the time, now it's probably on the computer, I've got a very thick book of, that I would go through. And sometimes I I feel like the process of doing that, because this is just the reality of making films, is that, well, they're, <laughs> they're hard. They're mentally hard. They're physically hard. And you're not the same person you are in week four than you were in week one. Person in week four is exhausted, you know, and uh, and uh, tired and this. So the idea of the what I call the brain book, doing this pre-production was was to make a safety net. So I go, okay, I can always say when I had a brain, you know, I can look through this thing and say, oh, this is what I wanted to do. It's this scene's fifty-three. Oh, this is my idea, and uh, and so now you, at least you have a place where, in all the exhaustion and stuff, you're not really going to fall any lower than that. And that that was the theory behind that. It, you know, eventually that that stuff all like went into the computer stuff like that. And, I mean, but the whole process of films is is very different depending on who you're with. I mean, I think the the the, gr the great thing about 
you know, I want not to sound like too much of a dinosaur, but how movies, you know, used to be made when, you know, you're kind of your triumvirate uh, at the kind of the top of the chain in terms of the look was the director, the cinematographer, and the production designer. And then, of course, contributions with the costume designers and every, everybody like that. But that that had a lot to do with the look. And then eventually that started to move over into, as things got into more special effects, all of a sudden you have a visual effects department who are setting things that have a lot to do with making the look months before the cinematographer has even been chosen. I mean, but what I but what I liked about those films was that you you at the end of the day you you'd have this sense of satisfaction. It's be, oh, we got this lovely scene today. You know, oh, I might have done this better, but overall, you know, and and also there was a flow of working with your crew with and in, in kind of a, a as a band works sometimes improvisationally. You have this chemistry back and forth that that carries you through the day. And, it, and and there there's a beauty in that. I am, and I'm sure a lot of that is true, but it, still now. But of course, the way things are starting to happen, you're starting not only to see, like, okay, a lot of this is going to happen inside a volume now. I mean, it's still creative filmmaking, but it has a very, I think, it has a very different feel than that being on an actual set. And then, um, you know, and I'm really glad that I did it, and I learned a lot, but uh, in in some ways, you, you look at the Avatar series, and they're, they're at the other end of the spectrum of the the kind of films that you make that have that, you know, where, you, where you're working with a group of people on a set. Uh, <laughs> and I, I'm going to correct myself, because even with Avatar, you're working with a tremendous amount of people on a set, and a tremendous amount of departments who are all contributing. But what, at the end of it, when you're on the set, cash free the live action, it all comes down to uh, things that were set in motion or even captured years ago. And then what happens is that you, even though you're making creative contributions, and, and I had the opportunity to make creative contributions in, I didn't light it every scene, of course, but I, I lit uh, scenes in the computer and they're, they're, okay, there's the lighting contribution there. But a lot of Avatar was taking the the real world and inserting it into this virtual world, this computer driven world. And you know, toward the end of Avatar was like all I could think is, oh, so you have one job and one job only, which is to make this actor, or or maybe it might be a couple of actors, integrate with this computer, you know, created world as seamlessly as, as possible. Because I think that if you, uh, you know, cause, cause I think people know when something's off, when something doesn't quite fit, or especially if you're in a, uh, you're, you're in a jungle or something like that, they'll, they'll, they'll know if something's bogus. So I digress, but in terms of the arc of what, what doing, I think that People will find that they they find that there are talents are best, best suited for certain kinds of cinematography because you you have very different playing fields now that you can be operating in. I see what's being done now, and I, I, some of it, well, a lot of it has to do with technology. Is that because of what the cameras are capable of, and what's capable of being done? in post-production in terms of how you mold an image. I'm, I'm seeing some of the most exciting images that I've ever seen in my life. People are just, and, and now with streaming, there's so now there's so many different venues that people, could, cinematographers can show their work. But I, I have to say, I'm just seeing like the most amazing stuff. You know, it's just great. They, things have opened up in, in, in that sense. Is there an over-reliance on the post-production process now, though, because you can do so much after the day that people are relying on it a little bit more heavily than they should or they used to? Maybe, probably. You know, I, I think that that. But if, if, if you have a commitment to your look and that commitment is also committed to with the director, 
and that you say, well, we're doing this and we know what we're going to do for this in post-production, then then it's just as, as much a part of the artistic arena of the cinematographer as anything else. You know, I, I'll just talk about one thing I saw last year. Uh, and it's a, a, I got his name, Sean Porter. He shot this, I think, uh, you should, the first episode of the series The Old Man with Jeff Bridges is totally amazing. And you, but you could see the total commitment between the director, the cinematographer, the production designer, and the DIT uh, when on um, the days that these images were captured, and then whoever was doing the, the final polish uh, in the color correction room. That's when you're seeing again all aspects, and now now you have more players. Yes. But if they're if they're gelling the, the way, you know, it, if they're on the same page, you 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 can take things to just this amazing place, and you know. But it still it takes it takes a lot of commitment then also on the part of everybody, but also time too, because the cinematographer has to be sure that he or she is in on that process. How do you analyze something when you're watching it? Like what to you, when you look at something like the first episode of The Old Man and you see a shot, what makes you go, that's a beautiful image? Well, sometimes it, sometimes you just go back to the basic. Of, that's a beautiful image because somebody took what was in front of the camera and just devised a wonderful contribution uh, composition, you know, that has so much music and so much poetry in it, and and uh, that makes it a beautiful image. But then, uh, then from where I go, it's like I usually say, you know, and it's not like I'm doing this, you know, constantly. But with something that's good, I'm going, wow! And look what they did with the light here, you know. Uh, or uh, I don't try and break down exactly how they got the thing, but I they say does this come together in a way that, that, that totally supports and has a, a, a major positive impact on the, on the story and the emotion of the scene? I, you know, it's funny because I can tell, I can tell right away. So, I mean, <laughs> I, I, I feel like, uh, much to my wife's chagrin, I, I can turn to her and they say, you know, we're watching something and said, this is really good. And I, you know, and I feel like this is going to or should win, you know, have some recognition for how good it is. You know, it's just, and, and that's only <laughs> because I've been through the fires, you know, myself. But I, I think just getting back to it, it's, it's really, I mean, having, having a vision or coming to a vision with the people and just being able to, com- to commit and communicate with, with that vision throughout the entire process. Is the goal of cinematography when you're making that impact, obviously you can see it because you're a pro, you're a master at this, you can admire the craft, but for the average person, is the goal for the cinematography to be so seamless that the average person doesn't even notice how good it is? Or is the intent for it to be noticed? I mean, it's a really good question because, you know, you, you, I'm going to look at like, Say somebody who I think is a genius, like Rodrigo Prieto, you know, he can go and he can, I mean, he can be just so supportive in terms of where the movie is going. So support, and if it, it, it could be Killers of the, the Flower Moon, or it could have been one of his first things, Broke Back Mountain, or he did 21 Grams before that. And he, he didn't get, get in the way but he i mean i think this is, it's amazing and then on the other end of the spectrum you either have somebody who says well, i'm just it makes a commitment to be totally in your face and i haven't seen poor things but i saw some of the other like okay we're going to take these wide angle lenses and we're just going to rub it in your face you know i don't think 
being showy is a bad thing unless it's being showy just for the sake of being showy. And somewhere along the line, you lost the idea that you were supporting the story or supporting the actor, something like that. I mean, let's see, the, the, the showiest, one of the showiest films of, of, you know, when I was, you know, looking at things as a younger person, well, of course, was everybody's showy film, like Blade Runner. I mean, that's one showy film. It's amazing. But that made, you know, that contributed so much to what that film was in a, in a good way. So I, I don't think there's, you know, the only bad or good of it is does it, does it contribute to making the film impactful and does it support the picture? And how do you figure out in your personal process how to make the biggest impact to the picture? Is it speaking with the director? Is it reading the script? Like, how do you figure out what the emotional truth of the story is and how you're able to support that truth with film? It's different. There are some films that I've done <laughs> that were a lot more relaxing. And the film, I would say the bar was lower, which was, you know, so if I'm doing a romantic comedy, it's, just, it's kind of like, it's all about, the lead actors and actresses and you, you kind of know what your mandate is and so now I look at those a lot of those films and I go oh I was really overdoing it there wasn't I you know but it <laughs> but it was kind of no harm no foul because you know okay so the actress has another backlight in her hair you know something like that but uh every everyone was different I think that uh uh it was so weird because with uh, so, sometimes the less said the better I when I came on to Titanic uh, Jim and I didn't have much time to talk at all you know because he, he was shooting the modern sections of the the film and uh, the as the studios in Mexico were being shot and so we had this really short conversation I was like well I want to know what this film is supposed to look like <laughs> so I didn't. So that's what I said to Jim. I said, "Well, well, talk to me about what the film should look like." And he said, "It's a period film. You know what period films look like." And that was it. You know. So, so I ran with that. But the other thing I did was I ran when when I could because I was also shooting another film at the same time that the prep was going on, and I had weekends to go down to Mexico and talk with the department. Two places I went to were uh, the art department just to see what their what their artwork looked like because I knew, well, you know, especially on a Jim Cameron film, there have been discussions and what you see is going to be driven by conversations the uh, production designer had with Jim. And also uh, I was looking at, I'd go to uh, the visual effects department because in there, you know, you're going to see tons of artwork too because especially at that time. I mean, every every visual effects shot usually has a tremendous uh, price tag on it. So that has to be worked out in detail. And then on top of that, I, I just looked at films that I like. Uh, oh, and he said something about uh, the epicness of uh, David Lean films. He said that's he, he wanted it to be. So, I, of course, I looked at Doki Shibago and uh, you know, Orange of Arabia and stuff like that. But I also looked at the Merchant Ivory films, you know. So it's like cinematographers steal from each other all the time, and and to to get benefit, and and we 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 should be watching, and and we're all we're all, anyway. Nothing's we're all affected by what's come before us or, or what other people are doing. I mean, uh, and so you know, I looked at something that Caleb Deschanel did, which was The Natural, which is an amazing film if you've never seen it. But it's uh, along with that, that's what it took to to get to the vision of the film. I just give you the reality check in all of this is that sometimes as a cinematographer, you might be working with somebody who doesn't know what their vision is, or who, who might have come out of writing, or something like that, and they. They know what they want to do with the story, but they don't know what they want to do. Uh, or there's another another scenario is you'll you'll go into a meeting with a director 
and he says, I just want to have, I, I want to have meetings all the time with all the departments about what this film is going to look like. Okay, touch of the reality is that director is so busy, you hardly ever get to talk with him or her. And so what happens is that what you learn is actually on the scouts of the location. A lot is learned in a location band scout, you know, just because when you've got a captive audience, you can talk with the director about that. But but you over these scouts, you start to see an evolution in thought of the, the director's uh, thought. And I, I think somebody said the... Uh, God, is this John Toll or uh, he said the cinematographer is the 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 guardian of the director's intent, and sometimes that means when you're on the set saying, "Oh yeah," but in in pre production you were talking about that this is where you wanted to go. And the director might say, "Oh yeah, right, okay," you know, or say, "Okay, well, I had a different idea." So so anyway, so you're. The, the the intent of the script and the director is, is one of your other assignments is to be aware of, of guarding that original intent. What are the types of questions you're asking the director to figure out what his intent is or her intent is? Well, sometimes it's just camera language. You know, I mean, by the time you're shooting, you, you and you've read the script enough, you, you in terms of lighting, you usually have a really good idea of where things are supposed to go anyway. But uh, a lot of times it's just film language. You know, uh, I just state something really, really obvious. But uh, so in Titanic, because people have seen that film, usually when you had, uh, when you were with, especially at the beginning of the film, when you were with Leo, the, the, the camera, was, especially when they're running on the ship, the camera's moving like crazy and it's chaotic. It's all steady camera. And then, some, sometimes he would take scenes where there was so much energy in them, like the, the dance below decks, uh, and then he'd cut them against what was going on with the, the richer people. And it was, the camera was, and this, this is hardly, Jim Harvey ever does this, but the camera was absolutely, you know, locked off just to jar the differences in energy, the diff, like the differences in life force. Uh, that that these people possess. You know, and I, I, I guess, you know, what I admire in other cinematographers is, in, in a lot of other cinematographers is that because I don't think I'm the, <laughs> I, I'm the, the person to go to on this, but I, that they are is, is just in terms of camera language and how, how it's, how it's supporting the script. And, uh, you know, some people are very, very deaf at, at uh, doing that. And also, uh, a lot of the films I've done are action films, so you're always just like, well, not a way to just keep the camera moving or keep six cameras moving, you know, in terms of action at the, at the same time. Especially if you're working with John Boo. So, so true. You know, it was like, I'd never seen anybody work like John Woo. And that he, he he could put seven cameras out there. And I was like, how, what, what, how do you like this? But how do you keep these cameras from slew each other? But but the way John Wu worked is that unlike any di- American director that I've been in, if he was doing an action sequence, he kind of designed, I, I call it like the Swiss watch. A method of designing the scene where you have all these moving parts, but they're moving so intricately, and he knows that this shot becomes this shot, and and here you here I have two two dollies, and they're almost running over each other, but I, he knows exactly how he's going to cut that scene, so he's just got a lot of intricate uh, shots, which amazingly somehow don't see each other, you know, in, in his, his scenes. And I, I learned a lot from, you know, and it, it served me well, actually kind of working with, with Jim on, on action scenes on you know, how, how to, how to do that. You've shot some of the 
most grand and epic movies ever, but you've also shot very intimate pictures. Do you have a preference at this stage in your career? Do you want to shoot something grand? Do you like these small, intimate movies? Where are you on that scale? Uh, con- confession. <laughs> when, I fin- when, I, when, I, when I finished Avatar 2 and 3, I was so exhausted uh, mentally, physically, emotionally. I felt like, I don't know if I want to do anything at this level of complexity again. And I have taken some time off. Actually, I'm in Indonesia now where our family has moved there. And then before that, it was COVID. But I, I think this could be the kiss of death because I said, I told my agent, I said, I don't want to do anything that I've done before. Basically, I just said, and I'd rather do something that, that that's small and speaks to themes that certainly I haven't addressed in, you know, the, the type of mainstream films that I've been doing. So we'll see how that goes. But, uh, so th- I think that answers your question. Though. I would, I would, I think I'd much rather work on a more intimate scale. You know, it, it was uh, where it's almost all about what's happening with the uh, after, you know, rather than all the hoopla that and that might be going on around, on around an actor. You know, that would be that's my new adventure. Yeah. I've heard you describe Parched as the most Russell movie you've shot in a long time. And I'm curious what makes a Russell movie. Well, I I don't know if it had anything to do with the style, but you know what it was what happened is, is that as I went along uh, and things got bigger and stuff. And then all of a sudden, I, because there were so many cameras out there, I wasn't operating, you know, and I was just, each take I was looking at monitors and stuff like that. Or because of the complexity of it, a lot of my thought also was, okay, okay, what's the next nightmare down the line? What's the next thing? Does this set ready? Is this set ready? Uh, the, all, you know, and it, I'll take it with me. The joy of that film, then it was a much smaller film. Uh, but I got to operate again. I just worked for the director. And that was pretty much it. It wasn't like a ton of different departments. It was, uh, and there was just something about that. There was this wonderful uh, simplicity and kind of back to the roots of when I was I was just starting out. And I think more than anything that that made it, and the, also the fact that. Although we did we did have um, some days we did have like big lights to work with, uh, which was great. Uh, but on other times we were just doing things with with little lights and Chinese lanterns or whatever they're you know just and kind of making it up as we went along. You know it was so much fun. You know like okay we have the scene and here's this white hut and. Well, we have 17 different looks now or, so, or something close. To, I mean, it was, okay, t- for sure, 12 different looks. And okay, and you just go, what are we going to do today here? You know, and, and just work with almost on the fly with my gaffer, very talented uh, Indian filmmaker. And uh, so I think that's what made it, uh, it made it a very happy experience for me. And just and just working with people who, also the uh, Indian crews were, uh, just it was just a great joy to uh, work with them. So I guess that's what made that a Russell film. That's awesome. I have so many other questions. We could go for another hour, but I want to be respectful of your time. Uh, maybe we'll have to get you back in here for a sequel at some point. Yeah, we could do that. Um, yeah, and also if if you do have something like I said, oh, I should have because this is what happens to me. You know, I, you're, you might be shooting something. Oh, I should have. Or if you have one of those moments or something, or even if you just, uh, we could get back together and do something uh, like this. I, think, I appreciate yeah, that. I uh, really appreciate that. I mean, you're a tremendously well prepared uh, interviewer. And it's just that uh, uh, it's made it like, a very good experience. So there you have it. 
I'm really glad to hear that. Thank you. Before we jump off, I just want to give you the floor. Is there anywhere people can find you, a website, a social media, plug anything you got right now? Oh, uh, I don't know if I have anything to plug. I probably, uh, uh, nope. No, uh, I don't even know. Uh, no. I, I, <laughs> uh, I'm on Facebook and I'm going to start. I, here I am in Indonesia and in Bali and I'm going to start uh, uh, putting some of my pictures up because I, I, what I'm intrigued by is that there, if you like, if you go on Instagram or Facebook, there, there's the, there's the Bali that the influencers have you seen, which is like your uh, beautiful beaches and people swinging and swings and sunsets and stuff like that. And there's a Bali that, uh, I don't think anybody ever sees, you, you know, that is a lot of, uh, uh, yeah. You know, and that, that part interests me, you know, so I'm, I'm probably going to be taking some pictures of, of that aspect of it. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this interview, make sure you subscribe to the podcast. And if you haven't already go and listen to our three and a half hour long profile on the director, James Cameron. And if you want even more from me, you could subscribe to the Artwell newsletter and the Artwell YouTube channel at the link in the show notes. And if you could do me one favor, can you just send this interview to one friend who you think would like it? And now, go do your thing. Whatever it is, do it well.